Our team is there, Yvonne Okora and the rest of the team. Yvonne, if you can hear me. I'm in studio with Mwenda Mijewe and he says our biggest undoing one is the NIS and two is that we do not work collectively as a community. What are the thoughts of your partner there? Indeed, yes, and those are some of the questions we will be tackling just a little later on as we look towards solutions and to see what sort of uh, way forward we can have. We now know we have a new person in charge of the NIS, but that conversation is coming a little later. We want to talk right now, thank you very much, Linda, we want to talk now about communication in the wake of the Westgate siege. And I'd just like to start off very quickly, um, Dennis, uh, you know, you're working in the office of the presidency. Where is the president today? He's in the United States of America for the United General Assembly. Okay. No government presence at the Westgate Mall today for the commemoration. In terms of optics, what does that say for you, Paul, message-wise? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's news to me. I wasn't aware that there wasn't any government official. Uh, but I do understand there's certain protocols that are involved in inviting government officials to events. And to be fair, on... Uh, did they Thursday. need an invitation, though? Uh, this particular protocols with... But they needed organized. an invitation to be present at the Westgate, do I think? do think... We'll pose that to certain, Dennis in a minute. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just... Uh, right. You know, my, as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned, and I know there are certain protocols that are involved when it comes to inviting government officials to specific events. So I'm not... I wasn't an organizer. I can't speak on their behalf. But to be fair, uh, on Thursday, the First Lady mm -hmm. was involved in a commemoration right. of the Westgate uh, attack at the National Museum. National Museums, yes. Uh, which was... There was uh, an exhibition uh, there, yeah, yes. But yes. Uh, it was pretty high level. The First Lady has... Uh, is quite representative of the administration, I must right. say. Today, the fact that there was no one, even the Deputy President... Well, it doesn't really sound good, okay. but like I said again, mm -hmm. I don't know the protocols right. that were involved. But there's, there's in someone here that. with us. That's uh, great. Maybe. Dennis? <laughs> maybe that's a better <laughs> question. <laughs> Who would understand the protocol of it? Would no. it have been too much to ask for government presence? Government was present in every household that was affected. There How was so? proper communication to every place. The president wrote out a letter to the victims. Uh, the president, the deputy president, wrote a letter, which was also published by the national newspapers in mm -hmm. this country. There was messages that went out. I mean, sometimes even for government itself, there must be a closure. As we have had here throughout this evening, there has been a number of attacks. What you're now telling government to do is that every year there will be a government coordinated memorial. We would rather that if there is a closure on this stuff, that memorial happens with the people who are affected. Because that sharing of story, giving each other strength, and those memories is what is more important in a memorial than just having a government officer who is going to come up to read a speech or a government policy. Those are things government does on a daily basis, interacts with households that are affected on a daily basis. So, we do not need okay. an event uh -huh. to do that. However, as Paul has rightly said, on Thursday, there was proper, not only the First Lady, mm -hmm. but there was proper government representation at the Kenyan National Museum. Okay. And you have those clips in the newsroom, I'm sure. All right, yes, we do. And we did in, run that story as well on Thursday. Uh, Ida Uesta, of course, you were the country director for Internews. Let's just talk about now, because we're discussing media and communications in the wake of the Westgate siege. Did the journalists ask the right questions? Let's talk about, first of all, what you think they did right, mm -hmm. and then let's come to some of the challenges, where you think uh, the story wasn't quite told, the right questions weren't asked. Yeah, of course, today is an important moment of on mainstream media asking those questions. I think some of the questions come a little too late, um, but I do think we need to acknowledge the difference between live reporting when the siege was ongoing, when a lot of information was uh, not known, when there was a lot of speculation, and then what happened once the siege was over. Um, with regard to the siege, it taught us important lessons about this interplay between mainstream media and social media. Um, it was very exciting. Um, lots of papers have been written about it in terms of you know, what it meant. The Boston bombings were a little bit similar. Westgate took it to another level where journalists really interacted with social media. They both symbiotically needed each other. But then something disturbing happened, and that is that um, I actually kept all of the newspapers, all of the mainstream newspapers from 21 September to um, I think three months afterwards, because this topic fascinates me yes. so much. Mm -hmm. What happened is, 
On the 29th of September, Westgate was off the front page in Kenya. And it was only when Wolves at Westgate uh, was broadcast, which is a month later, mm -hmm. that it was brought back onto the agenda again. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we heard throughout your two broadcasts mm -hmm. today and yesterday, there are questions that remain unanswered and that the media hasn't really pushed for. And other uh, questions like, what was the DNA science behind the forensics of identifying those mm -hmm. bodies, mm -hmm. both the terrorist bodies mm -hmm. as well as uh, victims? Um, what about Westgate, this massive building, so standing think, empty as a mall. Right. You know, we hear speculation about who's bought it, what's going to happen. The media hasn't asked those do questions. Do you think there's, some of the questions came a little too late? Because I do know uh, the local dailies today yeah. were talking about that DNA process and yes. how you probably haven't had enough information. Yes. Where are the bodies of uh, the said terrorists who were killed? What DNA has been done? Mm -hmm. Do you think the they questions came, are coming a little too they're late They're very now? late. They're very late. They're very late for victims. They're very late, late for people who've been affected. But also in terms of helping us understand the process, that's what the media is, it's history in the making. And I mean, this history has been in the making since 1980, Norfolk, um, 1998, Mpeketoni, the questions, I mean, Mpeketoni was off the front page after three days. Um, it doesn't really reflect the extent to which geopolitics, what, where Kenya is at now, uh, what that actually means for this country and for the region as a whole when those stories go off the front page so quickly. Okay, all right, and we'll come back and talk about that but, um, and, and carry on with this discussion. But I do understand that Mwenda Bijiwe, who is uh, at our Mombasa Road Studios, has a question for our panel tonight regarding communication. Um, yes, indeed, uh, Yvonne, I would, uh, I would want to... I didn't hear quite clearly on the protocol thing but if I had Paul well he was trying to say one of the hiccups we had was something to do with protocol government you know the bureaucracies however mr. Paul I don't know if you'd like to explain to the viewers today uh, about this problem of protocol and fighting terrorism because the moment we go into doing things the protocol way Remember 9-11 in the United States, it's written in the books, the protocol, that you don't shoot down a civilian aircraft. But terrorists have taken over a civilian aircraft and they have flown one into KICC, they have, fla they have flown the second into Times Tower, and now NSSF building is on target. Do we let that plane hit there or do we break the protocols? Because this protocol thing and terrorism never work. Okay, all right, great question there, Mwenda, thank you very much. Uh, protocol, um, and when, when that kicks in and, uh, you know, when it's time to sort of put the rule books aside when it comes to protocol, mm -hmm. what do you have to say? I think it's important that he puts his question into context. Mm -hmm. I was responding to a very specific question that you asked about the commemoration that was in today. Uh, well, but let's talk a little bit. Let's examine what we are talking about, Westgate and the communication that um, happened, you know, pre, during, and after mm -hmm. Westgate. I think it's very important for us to look into that. Uh -huh. A lot of the questions that are um, coming across even this evening are from citizens who feel that the process was pretty opaque. There are a lot of questions which have been unanswered, which certainly do deserve certain responses. And what these unanswered questions have led to, they've led to uh, a lack of a loss of credibility to some extent, um, a lack of a loss of trust and confidence in uh, officials who are charged with the responsibility. But what I, I don't want to get into details of what has been said and what hasn't been said. But what is the way forward? Mm -hmm. I think our counterterrorism communication strategy, if we had one mm -hmm. in place before Westgate. Uh, failed mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully after learning from Westgate uh, the counterterrorism communication strategy uh, should have been deployed uh, but from the questions that are being asked it seems Clearly, as though answers, uh, answers are, are still, still not okay. ca forthcoming right. and this is what I believe needs to have been done or needs to be done okay. uh, citizens uh -huh. need uh, to regain the credit, need the to confidence, the confidence right. in the administration. And that can only be done in and the communication and what is being said It can be done in the, the communication and what is being said. And it is still possible within uh, the confines of the security apparatus to agree on what 
can be declassified uh, and okay. disseminated right. to citizens. Okay. It is All still right. possible very to quickly, be able to... Yes, very quickly, because I know we want to pose a question, but just before we go into that, Dennis, was there a communication strategy during Westgate? There were so many Twitter handles saying all manner of different things. <coughs> the president himself said 15, and then, you know, we know, we know the debacle that took place in terms of letting Kenyans know what was going on and keeping them safe and assured that there was somebody in charge. Uh, Westgate happened as, at a time when very thought communication pattern government was being stitched. So we did not have, at least I know on the digital front, we did not have a digital communication strategy. That is true. We did not have one and we did not know who should communicate what. As I said earlier, it was even very difficult for any of the government digital uh, handles to confirm that actually there was a Westgate attack. Mm -hmm. So it forced some of us who had widely viewed uh, digital accounts to confirm the attack before even we went to the official government accounts. But I remember a day, that's now a day after the attack, uh -huh. we had a meeting with everyone who was handling a digital account because also what happened is when we got into government, we only had, up to now actually, we only have like 20% of the entire government uh, mm. framework on social, social media. media. Okay. So when people who got to office, they just picked people and put them on those places to perform at that time. There was no coordinated effort. But by the time we were doing a week after Westgate, we had a coordinated social media strategy. In fact, ever since, mm -hmm. we have a very clear, very clear coordinated, singular, and our approach on our digital strategy, especially on security. Uh -huh. That was a week later. During that time when all that communication was happening, do you think that helped or hurt the situation, helped or hurt the mood? Because Kenyans pick up, those who have access to social media, pick up a lot on the mood on social media. Did it help or hurt As at a, that time? We didn't, we, of course it didn't help much that we didn't have a strategy, but one of the things we did, because we knew we did not have one, we, we, we put out a note that everyone else who is handling social media for government should not put out anything unless it's put by Interior or by PSU Digital and State House Kenya. Okay. Partly because those were the centerpieces of the communication. But Yvonne, it's also good to reflect on what Paul was saying pre. Mm -hmm. we, it's important to look at uh, other people who are communicating about, the, about Westgate, the attack. Right. And one of the prominent ones was HSM Press, which mm -hmm. was the account for yeah, Al Shabaab. Al -Shabaab yes. In January 2013, the account, first it was created on December 7, 2011. Mm -hmm. In January 2013, the account put up some tweets mm -hmm. that indicated that there would be an attack in East Africa. Mm -hmm. Twitter then moved as an organization and killed HSM Press, mm -hmm. so it did not exist. In February, they came back as HSM Press with an underscore. Yeah. That was not mitigated. And because also, partly because mm -hmm. maybe at the time, intelligence did not have, the, uh, in my thinking, did not have a proper intelligence, digital intelligence arm, mm -hmm. which I now know exists as a full front, they were not able to capture that when it came in in February. All right, okay. So the tweet... Is, we will, we will is, come to that, Dennis, in okay. a moment, because there is a cybercrime office, and to say that they were not able to just hold that thought, uh, you know, raises some questions, because that preceded your office. The cybercrime has always existed at the CID, or has for some time. John, what do you make of, uh, of, of this conversation so far? I mean, it's a very interesting conversation, and just to pick up on what uh, Ida was saying, I just want to throw the question to the crowd. Do you think that the media handle communication during Westgate? Or that, did we do our jobs correctly? If there's anybody who has an opinion about that, Ahmed, maybe we start with you. Uh, I don't think um, the media handled it properly, especially after Westgate and during uh, Operation Salama Watch. What I've realized, uh, especially in Italy, is that the media sensationalized mm -hmm. the whole stuff about Italy. And it's, it was only a handful of journalists who actually came back and tried to find out the real truth behind what was being said in the national media. And it was, it was very saddening because uh, what the media forgot is that uh, you're dealing with human beings here as well, especially during the crackdown on illegal immigrants. Uh, there was a lot of sensationalization of stories about uh, uh, refugees being uh, terrorists. And also on the other side, the, the, the government, the Ministry of Interior didn't help because uh, um, the Department for Refugee Affairs, for example, is under Ministry of Interior. That, in my opinion, tells you that the government views refugees 
from a security prison. So in terms of communicating, we were following the lead of the government. Is that what exactly. you're saying? Exactly. And that, that was not fair. All right. Ali, maybe you can just take it on that side and okay. see if there are any other opinions. I'm answering about the question about the media, how it handled. The media yeah. handled it quite truly. That uh, helped me the, the situation about where the, where the officers, the Kenya, the Kenya, D, K, K, Kenya Defense Forces, uh, they were told they were taking water. Mm, that one, it's very lie. No, that one's very true, but the, but the media of the government uh, give us something direct, something indirect about that. Uh. All right. All right. Ida, do you want to? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I think uh, I would challenge anyone in this room or watching TV mm -hmm. now to kind of like to just imagine um, the incredible challenge it is to, bro to be broadcasting live from a scene like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the moment it happened, I think within 90 minutes, the first live TV cameras were there actually before even any of the security forces were inside mm -hmm. um, the mall. Um, when you, when you have poor communication, when, when, when the information isn't coming through, when there is this pressure to say something on air, when at the same time you're reporting on a siege, and as one citizen uh, TV reporter actually said on air, mm -hmm. she actually apologized on air after shots were shown of security forces sort of finally right. entering the mall, saying, uh -huh. oh my goodness, I'm not sure if we should have shown that, yeah, um, yeah. because you I can see that. the actual, actual yes. dilemma yes. of broadcasting a siege, and therefore perhaps even showing or, or, or perhaps even playing into the hands. Right. of attackers. Actually, okay. in the supermarket where, uh -huh. in the supermarket where even TVs are also being sold, uh -huh. and uh, most of the time are actually framed to the live television, uh -huh. when you show actually this guy, guy is coming in, you uh -huh. actually expose, actually the Israeli intelligence as a report, which is again online and can be Googled and found, they have analyzed that live coverage, and I've also analyzed 13,000 tweets that were sent out, okay. including Instagram images, right. that enable, and they have, they are, in their conclusion, they have actually said that we enabled the social media users and live TV coverage mm -hmm. for some, for some of the moments that are used to escape from the snare uh -huh. of the bullets. By seeing what was happening, Paul, very quickly, final. And um, how the communication was handled. Mm -hmm. I think it leads me back to the, 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 the issue I mentioned mm -hmm. on the counterterrorism communication strategy. When you put together counterterrorism communication strategy, you bring together all stakeholders who would mm -hmm. be involved mm -hmm. in the in, in a crisis before mm -hmm. it happens and the media is also one of them right. so expected protocols uh -huh. of engagement between all the stakeholders uh -huh. is clearly spelled out okay. and the counterterrorism communication strategy is also uh, simulated before a crisis uh -huh. and so that we, we all know what so to we know do, what to, what to, do, say, how what to, to cover. Okay. and even government right. uh, who was to communicate at that particular time would mm -hmm. have been clearly stipulated within the same right. uh, within the same strategy so but having a, a quick sop but, yes but, uh, but let me let me just finish conclude, yes. but coming 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 to where we are mm -hmm. right now uh, with all these questions with all these initiatives that have been put together like usalama watch and all with um, Nyumba Kumi. The question is, are citizens getting a buy-in? I uh -huh. think that there's an issue. There's a disconnect between what, what the government is doing and what and, the citizens yeah, perceive. And communication, sorry, can be, to... communication could be the bridge. Uh -huh. uh, we need to, for example, have messages that inform. When okay. people meet as Nyumba Kumi, All right. Is there a standard template of how those meetings should be conducted? Okay, you know, all right. Those are questions all right. that... I, I, I understand that. We're running out of uh, time. But I think your point is well made. I'd just like us to have some final thoughts, because at least on yours, it's understanding that we need to have a buy-in. And that needs to start with communication. Ida, your final thoughts on this way forward in terms of media and how yeah. to report this better? Um, Achari, talk about a protocol, because, but of course, I mean, nobody expected this event. Mm. I think we're all acknowledging that a year mm -hmm. later, neither the media nor the government, the security forces, there are lots of mistakes that have been made we've said earlier that the, the questions haven't really been asked about all of the mistakes but I mean in the absence of a protocol or in order to respond to something so unusual what really helps is if, if there's solid and sound ethics if this kind of interplay and interaction between mainstream media and social media can uh, kind of learnt from this process mm -hmm. then I think I mean I think if anything similar should ever happen again, I'm really quite convinced that we'll see an improvement okay. in terms of the interplay. All right, so for you, lessons learned in that one. All right, um, I think we've gotten that. We now have a communication strategy, digitally at least. You're talking about a buy-in. You're saying we have lessons learned. And, of course, those are some of... Um, 
the lessons we've learned, and that, of course, uh, talks about the two days that we've been here, KTN bottom line after the siege, and of course taking an audit not just of government, of security forces, but of media as well, and of us in general. And of course, the questions need to be asked, and we will continue to ask them. And we thank you for staying with us, so of course, do stay with us and keep your comments coming in. This is KTN bottom line. My name is Yvonne Aquara. We thank you for being with us this far. Asanteni sana basi watazamaji wetu pamoja na wageni ambao wamekuwa hapa bila shaka tumekuwa ni siku mbili ambazo zimetumeenda vema kabisa na vile vile kwa wale ambao wameweza kutoa maoni yao saa kuambatana na namna tuliweza kupeperusha taarifa hizi kupitia wakati ule wa Westgate ilivyokuwa wameshambuliwa tunasema shukran sana lakini cha msingi kumalizia tunachukua maneno ya bwana mmoja hapa kupitia mtandao wa kijamii amekuwa akishirikiana na sisi kuanzia jana mpaka leo Patrick Alushula anasema alimanzu na washikadau wote dau la usalama lizingatie usalama wa pembe zote za nchi utepetevu mahali popote huo basi ni utepetevu na ni tishio kwa taifa zima hashtag maalama reli after the siege asanteni sana nyota ambao umekuwa mkitufuata pia kupitia kwa mtandao wa kijamii mimi naitwa alimanzu asante kwa kutazama na mshukrani sana tunasema kuzungumza ndio kutafuta suluhu na mficha uchi bila shaka hawezi kuzaa leo ulikuwa ni mjadala wa wazi na hadi hapo wakati mwingine panapo majaliwa yake Mwenyezi Mungu mtaremezi nasema umkilala mlale salama mimi nimekuwa wenyu Muhammad Ali and I'm John Allen Namu just wishing you a good night and in remembering Westgate we must remember some of the lessons that uh, have come out from here in terms of survival in terms of being able to transcend the, the tragedies that we all face but also in terms of also asking the tough questions the hard questions of our government and of ourselves it is only through asking these questions it's only through interrogating the kind of issues that we go through as a country that we will be able to become better fix what is wrong with our country even us in the media are determined to do that once again this has been a special broadcast commemorating one year since the westgate attack and we'd like to wish you a good night and thank you for watching from here at city hall in nairobi good night